Um, I'm going to adopt my normal uh, teaching style at the Army Logistics University, where Colonel Harney was just recently, and I'm going to wander around this evening and sometimes face the screen and point at things and so on. So if you're looking to maintain eye contact, I don't do a lot of that. I wander around. Um, as you can tell, uh, I, if I'm good for nothing else in a situation like this, I'm good for ponderous titles. And this is obviously a ponderous title. Sherman's flying column at Kennesaw Mountain, Major General John McAllister Schofield, and the 23rd Army Corps, 10 June to 10 July, 1864. You know, of course, that we're in the midst of the Civil War sesquicentennial, all things to do with the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. And this is uh, the year uh, for all things related to 1864. And just a few weeks ago, I was at Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, which you will hear a lot about in this presentation, participating in the one and only 150th event I plan to be part of. It was a zoo. Uh, a bigger zoo than I care to be part of ever again, so I'm not going to do that. Um, again. And secondly, uh, a little quiz to start with. How many of you have any association with a place called Cobb County, Georgia? Oh, you do. There's, there's four. Excellent. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> here's a map of Cobb County, Georgia. You will see it again. <clears throat> I'd like you to take note of the fact that there is a pronounced yellow streak across the western and the southern portions of the county. This pronounced yellow streak, you will see again. Okay? So if you have uh, any desire to see Cobb County at a closer range, you can come up afterwards. The blue streaks on the map are the, uh, the creeks in the county and how the water drains around the county. Yes, physical geography is a little part of this uh, presentation. So with all of that as introduction, let's begin. Here's the order in which I plan to do things. You can tell who I work for, the Department of Defense. Therefore, there's an agenda slide. Here's the order of things. Uh, notice that we're going to talk about uh, more than just this place called Kennesaw, which is in Cobb County, near the county seat of Marietta. We're going to talk about that and uh, a place near the Chattahoochee River, which is fairly nearby. And then we'll attempt at the end, I hope, to answer the so what question. Who really cares? And then you can answer or ask me questions. Um, these are the three best books that I know of on, on Kennesaw Mountain. Notice that two of them have been published in the last uh, year. Um, the one by Earl J. Hess. Some of you might know the scholarship of Earl J. Hess. He's a very fine Civil War scholar, and I was uh, quite impressed with this book. You're going to see some of the maps from it as I move along. The one on the, uh, the far right-hand side by Dan Vermilia, who happens to work for the National Park Service, just came out this year. Another fine piece of work. Probably makes the best use of the letter and diary collection at, at Kennesaw Mountain of any uh, publication I have seen yet anywhere. And on the one, one on the far left-hand side has been out for a number of years, and it's quite well done uh, as well, too. Well, as the slide says in the category of shameless self-promotion, uh, later this summer, you should be able to purchase, if not right away, eventually, from the, uh, the government printing office, um, this little publication, which I wrote last year, and the Center of Military History, which is my department of the Army level activity, is now editing and preparing the maps for. In fact, I have the latest draft of the, uh, of the words with me, which is my homework for the coming weekend. Um, so, this is one of many of these... Uh, uh, that they call them pamphlets, they're a little more ambitious than that, that the Center of Military History is publishing uh, in this series, U.S. Army Campaigns of the Civil War. We're going through lots of uh, uh, commemoration event events within the Army now. The Civil War is one, uh, World War I, Vietnam, uh, the War of 1812, and so on. And so there are a lot of us working on these kinds of publications, and mine will be out a little later on uh, this year. As I said, I've just come from... Uh, from Kennesaw Mountain recently, <clears throat> and I'm going to make reference to the kinds of things you see here. Um, the commemoration there occurred over a three-day period, and um, it, was, it, it was amazing. I mean, it was song and dance, it was uh, uh, luminaries, uh, it was cannons going off. I happened to be involved in some of the cannon shooting and so on. 
Um, it was an amazing event. Um, really nicely done, uh, but awfully uh, large and, and engaging, a little too large for, for me on most occasions. Well, truth in advertising. Um, I grew up in Cobb County. So um, I moved in there in 1966 with my, my parents. Um, I lived there until 1983 when I went away to Philadelphia to study at Temple with Russell Wigley. And those little circles you see on the map there represent the location of my parents' home and the three schools I attended in the county. What is the point of that, you might ask? Uh, I know the ground, uh, and you're going to see some of the ground and hear about some of the ground and the events and the importance of those events as we go through the slide deck here. The point is, I've been there and been there often. The pronounced yellow streak across the, uh, the landscape of the county there is... Uh, something that I mentioned with regard to this map but haven't filled you in on yet, and that is the location of the old Sandtown Road. Um, it is one of the oldest roads in that region of the south. It goes back to an animal trail, a pioneer trail, uh, and eventually a paved road that goes by various names today, not all of them Sandtown. But it is that road that figures in these events prominently. And the two um, little rectangles you see there uh, are the location of the two events that we will focus this discussion on. Um, the larger of the two rectangles um, is going to, uh, encompasses the location of the, the lesser well-known of the two events, the smaller rectangle, the better known of the two events. But those two events taken together are significant in the story of the Atlanta campaign, which is significant in how the Civil War ends and is significant for the re-election of Abraham Lincoln. So all these things in one way or another tie together. And the little dotted uh, line there uh, encompasses the boundaries of, of Cobb County in case you hadn't figured that out already. Oops. Now, in order to get a running start, I'm gonna, I got a couple of slides here on the front end to kind of put things in context. Uh, bear in mind, wherever you see a red star on one of the slides, that matches one of the pages in your handouts. There are several maps in there, and there's also an order in there, Special Field Orders Number 28, dated 20, 24 June 1864, and I'm going to make reference to that in, in, fair, in fair detail as we go along. So, again, this is just standard stuff to set the context. You know probably already, just as well as I do, that in the spring of 1864, Ulysses S. Grant was elevated to the long vacant grade of Lieutenant General. Uh, William T. Sherman uh, was appointed to fill the command that Grant had vacated when he became General-in-Chief of the United States Army. Sherman uh, rose to command the Military Division of the Mississippi, which is the primary Union campaign in the Western theater. Uh, that made him an Army Group Commander. I have that in quotation marks because it's not a proper term, but nonetheless he commanded by virtue of his position, three Union armies. And we'll mention those as we move along. Grant and Sherman fashioned the simultaneous uh, offensives of 1864 that would begin the, the bloody process of destroying the Confe Confederacy over about a year's time. And all of this occurs in the context, as you know well, of, an, of a presidential election year that complicates that election year to be sure, and both the North and the South by 1864, were genuinely uh, war-weary. And the map on the left there just gives you a general idea of some of the locations associated with the Atlanta campaign, some of the major rivers, some of the major um, uh, geographic locations, pretty standard stuff as well. Let's begin to dig down a little bit now. This gives you an idea of the geography of the Atlanta campaign. The campaign begins in far northwestern Georgia, in the Ridge and Valley region there in early May of 1864, pitting William Tecumseh Sherman's three armies, I'll show you uh, an organizational table here pretty shortly, against the Army of Tennessee, commanded by Confederate General Joseph Eggleston Johnston. Um, the campaign progresses over its first month along the timeline that you see there on the screen, uh, through this Ridge and Valley region into this fairly flat and agriculturally productive region between the Ustanala and Etowah rivers. These are all Cherokee names because the Cherokee used to live there. And by early June, the campaign is closing in on Atlanta 
in that it has reached the semi-mountainous terrain to the northwest of the city um, around the town of Marietta along the Western and Atlantic Railroad. That railroad, depending on whether you were Confederate or Federal, was your main line of communication and supply. For the Federals back to Chattanooga and beyond, for the Confederates back to Atlanta and beyond. Uh, but we're going to spend most of our time on this so-called Kennesaw phase of the campaign, which lasts about one month. And think of it this way, too. By early June, Sherman had made tremendous progress toward Atlanta. Things were looking pretty good. Uh, he's about two-thirds of the way to the major geographic objective of the campaign, only a month into it. Let's dig down a little further um, into the, uh, the terrain that we'll, that we'll mention. Marietta sits uh, on a plateau in a semi-mountainous region, as you can see there. Uh, the most famous mountain nearby, of course, is the Twin Peaks of Kennesaw Mountain, which is now the core of a national battlefield administered by the National Park Service. Um, there are a number of other mountains nearby, Brush Mountain, Pine Mountain, Lost Mountain. Um, and all of the, or most of the creeks in, in the county um, rise in this watershed region of the county. Why does, that, why does that matter? To a 19th century army that moved about on foot and with horses, where water is and how it impedes movement uh, is, is a really big deal. And it would be for these people uh, in this time as well, for reasons you'll better understand uh, shortly. Now, my employer, the United States Army, um, likes this thing called bottom line up front. And in messages, you'll sometimes see the acronym BLUF, BLUF. So this is my BLUF slide. This is the bottom line up front. Everything that follows is summarized on this slide. So that from this point on, the details will be sorted out for you because you've already seen them in, in the macro, if you will. This is a map of the, the region we're going to deal with uh, in Cobb County, um, produced by a very famous Atlanta artist, now long deceased, Wilbur uh, Kurtz. Dr. Summers, I'm sure, knows uh, of Wilbur Kurtz. It's a very fine map, and it is enormously detailed. So I'm not going to pull you through every one of those microscopic details, but I will, do, uh, I will go so far as to do this. We're going to focus our energies on this Kennesaw phase, uh, about a month long, um, and for a fair portion of that time, the Confederate Army of Tennessee under General Johnston defended that red line that you see there, the Kennesaw line proper. Um, the Federal forces under Major General William Tecumseh Sherman um, operated as they, as they had traditionally in the campaign against the southern or left flank of that uh, line, uh, generally along that line. That line happens to be the Sandtown Road, which is the big yellow streak on the map on the floor and the big yellow streak you saw on the map earlier on the screen. So that uh, uh, encompasses a fair portion of one of the examples uh, I'll, I'll dig into in detail. Then the forces that we're going to be focusing on, those of the 23rd Army Corps, the Army of the Ohio under Major General John McAllister Schofield. Uh, then along with the rest of the Union Army, have to deal with the next line the Confederates defend, that of, uh, of Smyrna, which is centered over the Western and Atlantic Railroad as the Confederates fall back toward the Chattahoochee River uh, to defend Atlanta all the better in the process. Uh, and they only do that for a day or so, and then fall back to the Chattahoochee River line, which is a much more prominent line. Some, of, some portions of it survive even today, although not many, sadly. And the people we will focus on, the 23rd Army Corps, slide from the Union right to the Union left and conduct a river crossing, uh, a small river crossing operation of enormous importance. Uh, and that will close the discussion. So there is my presentation all in one slide. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, we will do more than just that. Uh, from late May to very early June, uh, the armies fought uh, out to the west of uh, Cobb County in Paulding County along this particular line from Dallas to New Hope to Pickett's Mill. Um, 
I won't get into the details of how the armies came there because we have other details to look into, but suffice to say that uh, when Sherman crossed the Etowah River and attempted to maneuver through Paulding County and bypass this semi-mountainous region that he knew from a visit here uh, when he was a much younger officer, the Confederates uh, sidled westward, if you will, blocked that, uh, that march, and that brings on the uh, couple of weeks of action along the Dallas, New Hope, and Pickett's Mill lines. The Federals eventually worked their way back uh, by sidling northward to the Western and Atlantic Railroad, picked it back up in very early June, bypassed the Alatoona Mountains in the process, which are to the north, and um, then faced the Confederates all over again in one of the three Kennesaw, line pro Kennesaw lines proper, uh, those running from Brush Mountain to, La to Pine Mountain to Lost Mountain, then after the Confederates fell back there, from there, the Mud Creek line, and then finally the Kennesaw line proper. If your head is spinning from uh, the mention of too many lines in too many places, don't worry about it. That's just context. Here are the, uh, the, the, the forces that we're going to discuss in some greater uh, detail. I said uh, Sherman was an army group commander. Yes, he commanded three armies, those of the Cumberland, the Tennessee, and the Ohio, respectively under Major Generals Thomas, McPherson, and Schofield. We're going to... Uh, uh, focus on Schofield, working for him. By this time, were just two division commanders, Brigadier General uh, Jacob Cox and Brigadier General Milo Haskell. This particular fellow here, Brigadier General Alvin Hovey, had become disgruntled and gone on leave and resigned, and that's a separate story that we won't get into tonight. But suffice to say that uh, for what we're going to take a look at, this is these are the primary folks we're going to be uh, uh, focusing our attention on. Uh, two infantry divisions and a cavalry division and their exploits against their Confederate opponents. You might have noticed by now this is a Union-centered presentation. Uh, that is indeed true because I think it's a much more interesting story than what's going on on the other side at the same time. So I'm going to focus on, the, on the, uh, uh, the more exciting part as I would describe it. We're going to uh, say a little bit about uh, the, their Confederate opponents, three corps under Lieutenant General Hardy, Lieutenant General Hood, Major General Loring, a Major General in this case because the previous commander, a Lieutenant General, had been killed, a Union artillery round on Pine Mountain. Um, but we're really going to focus our efforts on the cavalry, not so much that under Major General uh, Wheeler, who's off on the other end of the Confederate line, but this fellow here commanding one of the smallest units in the Confederate Army under Joseph E. Johnson, Brigadier General William H. Red Jackson, uh, with a rather small cavalry division there. For the events that we're going to take a look at, certainly the first of those, he's outnumbered by about, oh, three to one, four to one. Uh, it's a pretty bad force ratio, as we would label it these days. Again, necking down. Um, this so-called Kennesaw phase uh, features a lot of activity. We're going to focus on the Army of the Ohio. And for this portion of the Kennesaw, for the Atlanta campaign, the Army of the Ohio, which had operated either in the center or on the left of the Federal Army, now because of the way they come out of Paulding County and into Cobb County, ends up on the right of the Union Army. It's that portion that is the flanking element. It's that portion that generally operates against the Confederate uh, southern or left flank and causes, as has happened up to this point, Johnson to withdraw from one line to the next, uh, putting up remarkably little resistance in the process and greatly annoying the Confederate government to the point where uh, President Davis eventually fired him, but that's a little later in the story beyond what we will cover. Notice some of the prominent dates uh, for these various goings-on around uh, Marietta and Kennesaw. And again, we're going to focus at least initially on this, latter, for this last portion here, 19 June to 2 July. Um, the map simply shows you how the units made their way down into the Marietta area. The point here is that now Schofield, commanding the smallest of the Union armies, occupies the, Confederate, uh, the Federal rather right, and he's going to become the key guy in what follows. Um, here are some things that are going on in Sherman's mind. As, uh, again, this is a little, little more plainly displayed here, the three Kennesaw lines, Brush Mountain to Pine Mountain to Lost Mountain. 
eventually uh, a Mud Creek line along a little creek called, ironically, Mud Creek, and then finally back to the Kennesaw line proper. Um, but notice some of the other photographs in the, uh, in the slide. It looks like flooded areas, does it not? Um, this area received uh, weeks of torrential rains in 2009, which is exactly what it received in 1864. Had you visited this area in 2009, the landscape, at least in terms of how flooded it was, would have looked like what the Union Army faced in trying to move around in 1864. And indeed, it was tremendously flooded in 2009. But here are the kind of things now, we start to get into some specifics um, that were going on in Sherman's mind. What does he have to face as he faces the Confederates again uh, in this particular area? Incessant rain. It just never stops raining, or seemingly so. The Confederates are in this semi-mountainous region, so it's highly defensible, and they have time to dig in very deeply and very well. Sherman even characterizes the countryside as uh, one vast fort, uh, and indeed that's an accurate description. And going on in his mind is this struggle he has with himself about whether he should um, continue to flank and move the campaign progressively toward Atlanta, which has been successful up to this point, or whether he should now direct the Union Army to, to attack the Confederates frontally, to give over to frontal assault. And there's tension in his mind, and you can see it in his correspondence with the great many people that he uh, corresponded with, his wife, his superiors, his, uh, uh, his peers, and so on. And in his correspondence, it is, the, it is the struggle between whether he should continue to pursue strategy, as he understood it, really that's flanking operations, or whether he should assault the enemy, uh, frontally attack him in his, uh, in his defensive earthworks. And I want to read you a couple of things here. There are several things to read as we move along. Primary accounts from the period. Uh, this from a sergeant in the 100th Indiana. Uh, about the rain. He writes, it rained again last night. It beats all how much it rains here. We have had but little good weather since we started in and it is very disagreeable. We get water in our trenches and the ground is wet all the time and of course we are wet too. They lived in water. Uh, their clothing typically uh, soaked um, pretty much all the time for this, especially one month of con nearly continuous rain from late May to about the third, end of the third week of June, 1864. It slows the campaign down to a crawl. Sherman is debating all the more with himself about whether to continue uh, to exercise strategy, as he would see it, or to give over to assault. Um, and we're going to see what uh, results that, have, that has. Well, one uh, appears in a letter that he writes to Ulysses S. Grant on the 18th of June. It's what we would today call a back-channel letter. He writes this pretty much uh, on a personal basis to Ulysses S. Grant, and here's an interesting paragraph. My chief source of concern is the Army of the Cumberland, which is dreadfully slow. This is a direct reference to George Henry Thomas, who commands the Army of the Cumberland. Thomas is older than he is. He's senior in terms of date of commission to Major General, but he's junior in terms of position. He's only an Army commander. Sherman is an Army group or military division commander. Sherman continues, a fresh furrow in a plowed field will stop the whole column and all begin to entrench. I have again and again tried to impress on Thomas that we must assail and not defend. We are, we are the offensive, and yet it seems the whole army of the Cumberland is so habituated to be on the defensive that from its commander down to the lowest private, I cannot get it out of their heads. That's pretty direct, criti <coughs> excuse me, pretty direct criticism of a subordinate, and he does that to his... Uh, his erstwhile superior, uh, really more a peer, actually, because they had a, a, a special professional relationship. That letter to Ulysses S. Grant is a, is, is a very interesting one indeed. Well, we push on. Um, now with the Army of the Ohio is the flanking element. Uh, I'm going to breeze through this part of it pretty quickly. Um, that Corps and the 23rd Corps and the Army of the Cumberland's 20th Corps under Major General Joseph Hooker of Chancellorsville fame, now uh, campaigning in the West, um, find themselves on a road called the Marietta Powder Springs Road, which is beyond the Confederate left. And that road leads straight to Marietta. 
and to the Western and Atlantic Railroad, and the Federals intend to use that road as an avenue of approach to the vital supply line keeping the Confederates in the field. Um, the Confederates uh, respond uh, well and quickly by moving an entire infantry corps down there, that under Lieutenant General uh, Hood, and they fight on the 22nd of June, the Battle of Cobb Farm. And it stops that effort to reach the Western and Atlantic Railroad by way of the Marietta Powder Springs Road. This is an artist's rendition of the, uh, of the event from the period, which later inspired this painting by Sidney King, who painted uh, lots of scenes like this for the National Park Service for the centennial of the American Civil War. And the thing to take note of here is the openness of the ground. Um, now, for the first time in weeks, they were reaching an area where the ground was open and they could maneuver uh, more easily than they had. Another thing to take note of as well, in another period illustration, is this twin peaked mountain in the background. That's Kennesaw Mountain. And you're looking to the north. So you're south of it. Had you seen the mountain looking from the north, and it would be on the southern horizon, the order of the peaks would be the opposite. In other words, the bigger mountain would be over, uh, would be to the left. Yes. Um, yes, well, whatever. The point I was trying to make is, once you see the mountain from this perspective, I know Dick's going to kill me on this one. Um, once you see the mountain from this perspective, you are to the south of it. Uh, yes, if you see it from the north, it would be on the left. Here from the south, it's on the right. I knew eventually I would get it right. Um, the point here is that once the Federals reach this point and they cast their eyes to the north, they know that they are well south of the mountain um, and they are in an area where they're beginning to approach Marietta from a vulnerable area and the Confederates, if they go far enough, are going to have to give this line up entirely and retreat on toward uh, Atlanta and break the stalemate of, uh, of Kennesaw Mountain as it had developed. Um, this map simply shows, uh, in, in summary fashion, the, the way the units ended up uh, arranged after the Battle of Cobb Farm. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I want you to pay attention to what's here in the text box. This is the evolution of Sherman's frustration over time. The campaign has slowed down. Thomas is particularly slow. Sherman is mindful of how this plays into the presidential election of 1864, and you can see this unfolding in what he writes. He writes to Major General Halleck, who is basically chief of staff of the, Army of the, uh, 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 of the Union Army in the period, but I will not run head on his fortifications. Okay, that's reasonable. He hadn't done that in Paulding County either. Good. He writes to his wife four days later, I will not run butt-headed against any works prepared for us. Good. Constructive thinking. How does that begin to change as the campaign slows down practically to a standstill? When he writes to Grant on the 18th of June, I just read you a portion of that letter. He's now concerned about his largest of the three armies and how uh, slow they are approaching matters as far as he is concerned. And then he writes to Thomas in a message, in a message on the 24th of June, um, I propose to study the ground well the day after tomorrow. Um, he really means the 27th of June, not the 26th of June, and break through after letting him develop his line as much as possible and attenuate. Attenuate is a fancy word. It just means to stretch out. So by operating on the south end of the Confederate line against the Confederate left, part of which brings on the Battle of Cobb Farm, um, Sherman's intent is to make the Confederates stretch their line to the point where they cannot successfully defend it and then he's going to strike por uh, portions of it toward the center, as you will see uh, a little later on. So he issues then special field orders uh, number 28 on the 24th of June. Um, and this is what he conveys in that field order. And you have the order uh, in and amongst the materials that I gave you to take a look at. We're not going to read it. Uh, I'm going to characterize it for you, and you can read it on your own time. His orders to Thomas are to assault the center. And I'll make sense of this or attempt to on the map after I'm finished uh, uh, going over it. He tells McPherson that he is to assault the Confederate right or attack it and faint as well. That's a, that's a, a different matter. He tells Schofield, the guy that we're going to concentrate on, to attack the Confederate left. Um, and then the order goes on to the point where he conveys uh, the intent to destroy the Confederate army 
uh, all together. So in other words, Sherman has been debating with himself. He's now decided to conduct a frontal assault. And his, his ambition on the 27th of June is as big as all out of doors. He intends to, inst- to destroy the Confederate Army where it is. And he intends to do so, whoops, he intends to do so by attacking two uh, areas in the center, these two here, um, punch two holes in the Confederate line, and then at least destroy one half of the Army of, the Ten- Ar- Army of Tennessee in the field right then, right there. It will bring the campaign to an end. It will be a boost to Lincoln's uh, effort to be reelected, and thus the campaign and possibly the war will come to an end. I mean, that's ambition for you. All of this in one afternoon's time. Um, Sherman, as, as was his wont, uh, rode the lines daily. Uh, he rode uh, onto the, the south end of, uh, um, of, the, of the federal line on the 25th of June and saw there Major General Schofield who said, Boss, I need to take you out and show you something. You've told me to attack uh, largely frontally, though not entirely, but largely frontally, this end of the Confederate line down the same road where we failed only a handful of days ago. And since then, the Confederates have dug in so that they have no less than three batteries, that would be 12 guns, and infantry units dug in deeply and well, all focused on that road. Did you realize that that's what you were asking me to do? And Sherman's response was, oh, that's not really what I intended. Well, words matter. Uh, If that's not what you intended, then why did you tell me to do that? Um, And so you can sort some of the details out for this by reading three versions of it, and I will not torture you with all three of them, Um, But when I first read this, I thought, somebody's making something up. Because Sherman's memory of it in his memoirs, and if you are familiar with the the writings of William Tecumseh Sherman, the story changes over time. Uh, Leading one historian to call him a prevaricator, which is a fancy word for he's lying. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. But Sherman remembers some of it this way. I'll just read one sentence. I had consulted with Generals Thomas McPherson and Schofield, and we all agreed that we could not with prudence stretch out anymore, and therefore there was no alternative but to attack fortified lines, a thing carefully avoided up to that time. Okay, that's one version. Schofield remembers it differently, you might imagine. Schofield remembers it this way in his memoirs. Published in 1897, by which, Sher- by which time Sherman was dead... So you might think, is he making this up? Because they did, on occasion, make things up. Um, Again, I won't read it all to you, but I'll read some of it to you. I did not see Thomas or McPherson for some days before the assault. Well, the boss said everybody was in agreement. I guess you could do that remotely. But I believe their judgment, like mine, was opposed to it. Undoubtedly, it was generally opposed, though deferentially, as became subordinates toward the commanding general. If you've ever been around the military for any length of time, you have seen this dynamic yourself. And then he goes on to describe the situation, and he basically says to Sherman, come out to the, uh, to the front line with me. Go on uh, a, a recon with me, and let me show you what's out there. He did. And he pointed out to Sherman, uh, boss, this is what you want me to do. I don't think we should do that. And Sherman's answer was, yes, you're right. We should not do that. I want you only to demonstrate in that area, and I want you to concentrate on getting around the end of the Confederate line by whatever means you think is effective uh, to do so. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting version of it. Um, And then I found in the official records of the War of the Rebellion a message late on the evening of the 25th of June from Sherman to Thomas that recapitulates it pretty much as Thomas had laid it, I mean, as Schofield rather, uh, had laid it out. Sherman had gone to the front line on the south end. He had met with Schofield. They had gone to uh, to the fighting front, so to speak. They had reconned uh, the situation, and Sherman came to see it uh, as uh, as Schofield uh, saw it. So they they changed the plan. It is not to attack straight ahead, but rather to work around uh, the flanks. 
Um, and they do so uh, on the 27th of June um, at points north of the ones I've just described to you. Um, this is the field or order by which uh, Schofield is going to carry out the, uh, the revised uh, commander's intent, as we would call it today. Um, and the really important part of this is that the division under Brigadier General Cox, um, just one division of the smallest corps uh, in, or the, the smallest army by far, and one of the smallest corps uh, in, in uh, Sherman's army group, is going to work around the south end of the Confederate flank. And their job, as you can see here, is to divert Confederate attention and to attract Confederate forces uh, to that flank. Okay? All well and good. The thing we know is Kennesaw Mountain uh, occurs on the 27th of June. We remember it through uh, images like this. This is an 1880s painting uh, showing very conventional Civil War combat of the period with long lines uh, on open fields, batteries dug in all over the place on high, excuse me, on high ground. Uh, the fighting at, uh, at Cheatham Hill, uh, very uh, um, um, famously rendered here again by Sidney King. Uh, this is a place that we call Cheatham Hill. They call it a dead angle. Uh, the Federals on this day suffered about 3,000 casualties in, a, in just a couple hours' time. The Confederates only about 800. And really, they got absolutely nothing out of this, save killed and injured people. Um, now, nothing out of it right here. They get something out of it someplace else. Yet more images of the traditional story. Well, what's going on elsewhere and otherwise is just as important as what's going on up at this place called Cheatham Hill, which is now the core of the national battlefield there and where I spent some time about three weeks ago. What's going on otherwise is what Sherman characterized then and later as a big Indian war. Uh, it's the skirmishing, it's the open order fighting with units not shoulder to shoulder in the traditional fashion uh, that is as much as anything else, uh, in fact, more than anything else in my judgment, the really important part of this, and this is a period rendition of it, um, showing a... a Skirmishing, the art of skirmishing, as one historian has recently called it. Um, this is a map from Earl Hess's uh, book. I'm going to just very generally tell you that this thing we have called the Sandtown Road that's important, the Federals have been, and on this day, the 27th of June, continue to use it as an avenue to get around the Confederate line, uh, which now stretches below Marietta, guarding uh, the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Um, Again, this is the Confederate line. And the Federals, primarily the 23rd Army Corps under Schofield, working their way down this, uh, uh, this, uh, this road called uh, the Sandtown Road. And the Federals, um, in a remarkably nonlinear use of, uh, of the brigades within, especially Cox's division of the 23rd Corps, stretched themselves out over a three-mile uh, area from uh, the far left to the far right of the division, and the long story made short there is that they place themselves so they can dominate this little intersection right here, as you're going to see later uh, in uh, a separate image, that is just as important as anything that occurred uh, at Kennesaw Mountain, near Kennesaw Mountain, or within the National Park, which is really how we remember all of this. Um, this is uh, uh, a modern map. Um, Google Earth and Google Maps are wonderful research tools if you've never used them. I understand in Florida now you can use them to case somebody's house so you can break in later. So we'll probably see some restrictions on the use of Google Maps in the future. If you didn't see that news story lately, I was just dumbfounded by it. Yeah. But anyway, um, metropolitan Atlanta has grown tremendously over the decades since. This place is, is covered over with... Um, uh, residential development, but you can still find the Sandtown Road um, in its original course running through the countryside just as it did in 1864, and you can drive the same roads that they moved along, the Union Army did, to get around the left of Johnston's line, and you can see the terrain much as they saw it. It's more heavily forested now, but it's hard to change the landforms underneath, and it's hard to change the creeks. And if you're really careful about it, you can piece it all together uh, if you're diligent and take a, a fair amount of time. So, 
This represents the general track of the Confederate Army, the southern end of it. Hood's Corps, as it stretched itself out after the Battle of Cobb Farm, or attenuated, as, uh, as Sherman put it. That's a bridging operation on a, near, a creek nearby, right before the Battle of Cobb Farm. Brigadier General Cox establishes his headquarters at the Cheney House, you can see there. This is the Confederate opposition he fakes, faces a little farther south on the same road on the other side of a critical creek in the area called Ollie's Creek. That's uh, Brigadier General William H. Red Jackson's Cavalry Division and a little bit of attached artillery. And here is how John Schofield and Jacob Cox crack this little tactical nut. They oppose uh, Jackson with a brigade, effectively fixing him in place. Then on the evening of the 26th of June, they connect their operations with that of the neighboring division with one brigade, so they don't lose touch with the, uh, with the supporting unit. Then on the evening of the 26th, they bridge um, Ollie's Creek and put one brigade on the south side of the creek on high ground and dig it in. Effectively, Johnston's position is turned. Somebody is on the other side of a critical body of water, on key terrain, has dug in, and is ready to move when the sun comes up the next day on the 27th. Early that morning, um, starting about 5 in the morning, another brigade crosses over that second bridge you see there, it begins to work its way down toward Jackson's Cavalry Division, and a portion of the first brigade that had moved into position, I'm not going to torture you with all these brigade commanders' names, this guy's name is Riley here, but a portion of his brigade goes down the creek, crosses over, uh, and opposes Jackson's division from the, the south bank as well. So what you have here is an elaborate, a fairly elaborate, and very skillful, I think, fix and double envelopment action that has taken place in just a matter of a few hours, on, in, in the wee hours of the morning of the 26th of, uh, 27th of June, um, 1864. Um, Johnson's line is effectively turned by one brigade maneuvering, not by eight brigades to the north that had thrown themselves against entrenched lines. That's the, uh, the significance of it, I think. The uh, Confederate Cavalry Division uh, basically gets out of the way of bigger forces, and those forces move on to um, some more key terrain to the south from which they can dominate um, a, uh, a, a critical road junction that I'll show you uh, in just a minute. So all of this takes place by 9 in the morning um, before the attacks to the north that are supposed to destroy the Army of Tennessee take place. And really what matters is what happens right here. It's in suburban neighborhoods. It's not memorialized except for some state uh, historical markers. Uh, there's no national park for it, um, but it is just as significant as anything that took place uh, to the north of it. And what do the Federals gain access to by this particular action? To this road right here, they knew it as the Rough Station Road. We know it as the Concord Road, and that gives them unimpeded access to the Western and Atlantic Railroad beyond the left of the Confederate line, and Johnston understands what that means. That means he can't occupy the Kennesaw line anymore. The Kennesaw stalemate is broken, and the people who do it uh, do so without attacking anybody frontally. I pieced a lot of this together from um, the memoirs uh, of Jacob Dolson Cox. He was a citizen soldier. Um, he was not a professionally trained soldier. He took, his, uh, he took his task seriously. He read deeply in the military art and science and military history. He had books shipped to, uh, shipped, uh, shipped to him uh, at the front line, and he would read them and send them home and ask for more. So here's a guy who's educating himself as he's, as he's completing uh, the task of being uh, eventually a, a division commander. And he renders in his, uh, in his memoirs this little map right here that and I've seen the maps that the other historians have produced, and they have not figured this out because they don't know the terrain. They didn't grow up in Cobb County. Uh, they didn't live near the Sandtown Road. Their elementary school wasn't near it. Their junior high school wasn't near it, and so forth. I'm just teasing you, but there's some truth in that. Um, 
if you actually go to the ground and you drive it, and you look at the lay of the land, you can figure out that Cox's division got much farther along than, uh, than other historians have, uh, have suggested to ground this imminently defensible and from which the artillery under Cox's command could dominate a critical uh, road intersection that's this one right here. This is our, whoops, how did we do that? Okay, we did it that way. Um, we've been talking about the Sandtown Road. It meets the Marietta Sandtown Road uh, just a little farther away, and that intersection is very close to the Rust Station Road, which leads you over to the Western and Atlantic Railroad. It is amazing what a close examination of the ground uh, will yield. Sherman and Thomas write uh, messages back and forth to each other that day, the 27th of June. They're needling each other, uh, to say the very least, about what's happening uh, on Thomas's front in particular, where... Um, um, uh, five brigades have suffered a tremendous defeat. Um, but to the south, um, Sherman is exchanging messages, or Schofield and his divisions are to the south, and Sherman is exchanging messages with them. Um, and he finally receives one uh, late in the evening from John Schofield, and uh, it reads in part thus, General Cox has just reported in person. He has advanced to the crest of the main ridge or a mile or so beyond Ollie's Creek, and within a mile of the main road run, running to the mill on Nickajack Creek, so on and so forth. Um, he goes on uh, this way. I believe Cox's present position far more valuable than any he can gain by moving toward the railroad. Then they exchange some more uh, messages uh, on that, uh, that basic theme. And the, the exchange of messages uh, ends uh, this way with Cox writing to, uh, to Schofield later in the day. Upon carefully reexamining the ground, my conviction is strengthened that it is exceedingly desirable to hold all we have gained. Um, yet, uh, yet more message traffic, Schofield to Cox later in the day, no material advantage has been gained anywhere except that gained by you. Make your position very strong. I regard it as the key to the next movement. And then he finishes this message Schofield does to Cox. I do not think the importance of the position you have gained can be overestimated especially in view of the failure elsewhere and probable future movements. I wondered if they had fully appreciated what they had done that day. And the message traffic that they were sending back and forth to one another proves, I think, they were fully aware of the significance of what they had achieved, even though they were generally unfamiliar uh, with the terrain, never having been there themselves uh, before. So if you go there today... Um, as I have many, many times on that very road. Uh, you'll find there, it's called the Floyd Road, that's actually the old Sandtown Road. You see that historical marker there on the left, the Georgia State Historical Marker. Um, you, know, you can read it in your own, you can Google this and you can find it. It's very easy to find. Um, but basically it tells a similar story, but it makes vague references to where things happened and how important the ground was to those events. Um, and once you really dig into the primary record, into Cox's memoirs, into the message traffic, drive the ground, look at the lay of the, of the land and the roads. It all begins to come together. And this innocuous intersection of roads, which is not a national park, um, has no uh, state memorial erected next to it, uh, is just as important as anything inside the national park. This is the road, this is the intersection where the Marietta Sandtown Road, which is now called Hicks Road, meets uh, the Rust Station Road, which is now called Concord Road. This is the first road you reach going south where you can turn east and reach the railroad and turn Johnston's position. And once they got close enough to realize what they had uh, were, were uh, in the area, uh, close enough to dominate, uh, they understood what they had done. They had broken the stalemate at Kennesaw Mountain by maneuver, uh, by careful... Uh, uh, examination of the ground as they moved over it, and uh, this whole business of throwing brigades at fortified lines. Indeed, it kept Confederates up there, but it had not broken uh, the stalemate. And you can drive down along this road and see the very uh, sculpted terrain, um, and it's interesting, but, uh, but we move on. Um, so, what had Kennesaw uh, yielded up? Well, the Special Field Orders Number 28 intended one thing, 
and they had achieved quite a different thing at a different uh, part of the Union line. Uh, by dominating this road intersection, which again is this one right here, that still survives, this is, covers events over the next few days, they had achieved what Cox called a pont d'appui, uh, French for fulcrum. In other words, the Union Army would pile into this area over the next several days, use it as a pivot then to maneuver toward the Western and Atlantic Railroad and force the Confederates, hopefully, all the way to and beyond uh, the Chattahoochee River. The ironic part of it is, on what I regard as Sherman's worst day as a soldier, um, none other than uh, this uh, division commander, Jacob Cox, a fairly uh, obscure man, had accomplished something uh, tremendously significant and he was but a citizen soldier uh, uh, in doing so. This next example is much shorter because it's the much better known of the two, and we're going to flip through it fairly quickly so we can come fairly close to holding to our timeline. Um, I showed you earlier that uh, after Kennesaw, the Confederates moved back to uh, another line, the Smyrna line, then eventually moved on to the uh, to the Chattahoochee River line, some portions of which remain to this day. Um, there's a field order attempting to deal with uh, that situa situation, put the Union Army on the south bank of the Chattahoochee. Uh, special field order is number 46. When you look at the details, the guy who's going to be front and center again is Brigadier General Cox. Uh, and he's going to do something, uh, I think, rather uh, uh, similar to what he had done um, up a little farther north uh, to turn the Kennesaw line except this time he's going to do it over a river, uh, over the Chattahoochee River in this general vicinity here, a place called Soap Creek. Uh, the Chattahoochee National Riverway preserves some of this. You can actually hike in there today. I'll show you a couple of views as we move along here. So as we come out of Kennesaw, this is where we focused our, much of our attention up to this point. The Confederates then withdraw to the Smyrna Line, then to the River Line, and it is Sherman's task to turn uh, the river line somehow, some way, without resorting to uh, a frontal assault. When the Union Army closed in on the river line, um, they reconnoitered it just as they had done all the other lines, and the Union Army's chief engineer, Captain Orlando uh, uh, M. Cox, uh, went to Sherman and said, listen, this line is the strongest we have, have seen in the campaign up to this point. The message being, you really shouldn't assault this like you did at Kennesaw, Let's find another way around it. Um, and here is the line that they saw. Um, it had been uh, built under the direction of Brigadier General Francis Shoup, who was the Confederate Army's chief of artillery. He had, uh, this is a special project he had talked Johnston into. Um, it, is a, it is a remarkable line in that it's not really a continuous line as we would understand one. It's a series of strong points ranged almost in like a sawtooth uh, fashion with log stockades connecting them, re-entrant angles, uh, and artillery at the, at the base of each of these re-entrant angles. This was a death trap waiting to happen. Had the Federals assaulted it, and Cox, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, no, Orlando Cox, different from Jacob Cox, Orlando Cox is the engineer, talks Sherman uh, out of any thoughts of, of attacking this line. Well, the Confederate dilemma in defending the Chattahoochee River is, uh, is significant. Uh, they uh, cram most of the army on the north bank of the river into the, into the river line, which is really not what Shoup had intended, but we don't have time to get into those details. And up and down the river on both sides, there are numerous ferries and fords, a few bridges, but numerous ferries and fords, and they don't have anywhere near the number of people uh, to... Uh, uh, to defend all that many places at once. And as you can see, our man Schofield here is moving toward um, the river. What we have concentrated on before, uh, on uh, earlier rather, is uh, an area up in this general area. And now we're going to move over a bit uh, to this area along the Chattahoochee River. You can see that scar in the, uh, in the landscape there. That's the channel of Soap Creek, uh, and, the, and the Confederate River line is about half a dozen or so miles farther down um, the river. And we're going to zoom in on that, uh, that area right here in the next map view. Um, and the Federals uh, accomplished the crossing this way. Sherman gave Schofield a task. 
Go uh, recon the river from Soap Creek all the way up to Roswell, which is about 15 miles north of the Confederate line upon uh, an area of the river where it turns for an, uh, like an east-west uh, channel way up there. And Schofield really only on the 7th of July got as far as Soap Creek, sent a report back to Sherman and said, you know what, not only is this a good place to cross, not only can we put a, a pontoon bridge here easily, but the Confederates are basically not defending the South Bank. All I found there was a, a small uh, squadron of cavalry and one or two pieces of artillery. I mean, this kind of gives you an idea of what Johnston's dilemma was all about. He didn't even remotely have the people to defend all of, this, all of these river crossings. And so the Federals accomplished their, their crossing movement this way. The Confederates defend it very minimally on the South Bank, uh, one brigade crosses on a fish dam. What is a fish dam? It's basically rocks placed in the river uh, in a wedge shape like this. When the river runs low, the water gathers and you can catch fish uh, behind the dam. The flow of the water is this way. Um, the Federals walk across the river on the rocks of the fish dam. Uh, eventually, an entire brigade gets over there, and the Confederates are, are totally freaked out. They can't imagine that the Federals have come across the river. There's no bridge. There's no pontoons. A little bit later, the Federals cross uh, down the river a bit on pontoons, um, and before long, the Confederates are just, they're, they're getting out of there. There's only a handful of them. They fire one shot from an artillery piece, abandon the artillery piece, and run away. And the Federals, before long, have two brigades on the south bank. Before the, the night is over, they have two pontoon bridges laid. Uh, come uh, sun up the next morning, they have an entire division on the south bank, and it's dug in. And Johnson is turned again. And this time, rather than the frontal assaults of Kennesaw, they bypass all of that together, and they cross the river uh, by this uh, surprise operation in an area where the river passes through a narrow channel with 200-foot uh, ridgelines on either side. It's a very, very pretty part of the river e even today. Pontoon bridges like they used, or pontoons like they crossed on for the assault crossing, pontoon bridge like they laid. Uh, you can even go uh, along the, the narrow channel of Soap Creek today, see a, an old paper factory there. Um, I drove around, uh, I've driven around there many times. Too many rich people live there, you can't see a thing. Um, I was trying to portray in this, uh, this image how high the terrain is on both sides of the river. It's about 200 feet high on both sides, and I just totally missed the point, but I thought you'd like the picture anyway. And now we come to the so what. Here are the kind of things that I think characterize both of these moments in time. What do we get out of this? I think it tells us or gives us a, uh, an, an interesting real-world example of how maneuver often yields far better results than attacking the enemy in place, dug in. That's a big duh. Wouldn't you think that'd be a matter of common sense? Sherman was taken to task at the time. He owned up to his mistake, even became sassy about it in his correspondence in the, in the following weeks. Um, I could read you some spicy quotations. Sherman's always good for a spicy quotation. He said, I began to regard the mangling of a few thousand men in the morning as a kind of romp. Uh, you might be familiar with that letter. I don't think I quoted it exactly, but it's fairly close. I think that the relative non-linearity of what Jacob Cox was up to stand, stands out by comparison to the devotion to linearity that you find in most of these Civil War battles. Here's a guy who could maneuver over the open country. When they turned the Kennesaw line, Cox's division occupied a three-mile front, four brigades separated over a three-mile front, connected by a line of skirmishers and some cavalry from George Stoneman's division. This is relatively nonlinear here, uh, and they achieved great re uh, results from it rather than this war of positions going on. If you're familiar with the scholarship of Earl Hess, he's called this the art of skirmishing, I think this is a strikingly uh, good example of the kind of thing that Earl Hess has written about. Um, and because I've been involved in battlefield interpretation for decades, 
I think this gives us reason for thinking about an expanded definition of what battle is and what battlefields are. Um, you can go to the National Park and you can see all the conventional stuff memorialized there, and I'm not criticizing it. I used to work there. Um, the place is, is, is very special to me to this day. Um, but our vision of this probably ought to get expanded. And I found while conducting this, uh, this research that um, the allied sciences of physical geography and being able to move around on the ground with a map and a compass, not a GPS, uh, was a, a very useful skill. So uh, let me finish with a very short... Uh, quotation here from Jacob Cox, and we'll turn it over to questions. Cox writes, about the whole month of June, it was a month of continuous sharp skirmishing combat with occasional severe engagements. It was a month in which the troops had been day and night under fire, and the incessant strain on nerve and brain had never for a moment been relaxed. It was a month of continuous pouring rains, converting the camps into mire and the roads into almost impassable sloughs making insignificant streams as obstructive as rivers and multiplying the discomforts and the perils of duty in the trenches or on the picket. Today we would call that continuous operations. They experienced it just as much in 1864 and found ways nonetheless to make progress. Thank you. Yes, I assume that this Jacob Cox is the same Jacob Cox that commanded the Kanawha Division and periodically commanded the Ninth Corps during the Maryland campaign in the Battle of Antietam. He's the same Jacob Cox who was promoted to Major General and then reduced to Brigadier General when they found out there were too many Major Generals. He eventually made it back to Major General, by the way. Uh, was General Sherman the type of person that people would talk to, or the subordinates would talk to, or is this just one case where they happened to come up and tell him some stuff? Or did he have that kind of personality where his subordinates would talk to him? Um, I, I think it depended on which subordinate you were. George Thomas could tell him what he thought and did. Uh, George Thomas did not agree with what happened on the 27th of June, but then George Thomas was an old soldier. The commanding general had said, do it. I don't like it, um, but we're going to have to go do it nonetheless, and they did. Uh, Schofield, if we choose to take Schofield's rendition of the events on the 25th of June as accurate, and I think the message late that day from Sherman to Thomas gives some credence to it, Schofield had nerve, and remember, he's pretty junior, though he is an Army and Department commander that gives him a special perch that others don't have, nonetheless said, boss, I need to show you something. This is not good. I need to do something different. He got permission to do something different, and he did something remarkably different from what he was actually supposed to do that was just a little different. Uh, he went way far south of where he was really supposed to go and achieved something, I think, hugely significant for that initiative and following success with more success rather than just sticking to a plan because that was the plan. Yeah. Right, right. Where did you get the copies of the letters that you read from? Um, they're in the, uh, most of them, though not all of them, are they in the official records of the War of the Rebellion? If you dig into the correspondence, um, they try to arrange it uh, chronologically by day, but you have to be really careful how you read it because some of it is out of sequence, some of it they were kind of guessing as to the right sequence when they put it in the volumes. So you really have to do a lot of figuring out about when things arrived and when they were sent out. There are some dates on some of those messages, I mean time rather, on, times on some of those message, messages so you know. But you also should know that for uh, at least the goings on around Kennesaw, Sherman, uh, Sherman's command post was at a place called Signal Hill and he was connected to the army group commanders, I mean to the army commanders, to Thomas, to McPherson, and Schofield by telegraph. 
They had virtually instantaneous communication with one another, and then subordinates went out from those locations both to deliver orders and then coming back to deliver situation reports. So the correspondence between Sherman and Thomas, which I didn't have time to read as much of as I wanted to, got really sharp during the day. Uh, Thomas sending a message back, we've gained no advantage today. Uh, if you continue this, it will use up my army. You know, one or two more of these and it will use up my army. Sherman writes or telegraphs back, there was one advantage of the day and it's what Schofield accomplished to the south. So they're, they're needling each other, I think, in, in, the, uh, in, in the message traffic as we would characterize it today. They're needling each other. But only Thomas could get away with that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you talked a lot about the importance of knowing the ground, which obviously is the case. I'm wondering, in your research, if you found much reliance or uh, uh, access uh, to uh, maps uh, and that sort of thing at the time. Uh, you know, I think in the Army of Northern Virginia, they had uh, Hotchkiss and others and doing all that sort of thing. Was there, were there many maps available, or did they have to depend on uh, immediate reconnaissance? They depended on both. Uh, and they make uh, reference, and I don't know, maybe uh, Dick knows this better than I do. They made reference to Merrill's map in some of the, uh, the message traffic. I don't know what Merrill's map is, but the cavalry brought them uh, intel from the field. Um, and they were, they were, I think they were remarkably good, probably better than we are, at understand, understanding the ground they were on for what it was. Um, I don't think we... <laughs> Frankly, I don't think we get out enough anymore uh, and go into the woods and walk around and walk over creeks and walk into bushes and see Mr. Snake and get Mr. Mr. Tick on your leg and things like that. They lived uh, a, a life, I think, that was closer to that sort of thing than we do. In order to understand this, I fully believe and have for decades, you've got to get out and get on the ground and get sweaty and get dirty and get ticks on you and see Mr. Snake. Um, and that way you understand this stuff better by going into the environment and trying to appreciate the lay of the land and what it means and the story it tells you like they did. By the way, I saw the biggest black snake I've ever seen at Kennesaw Mountain, five and a half feet of black snake. It had eaten a meal recently and it was shimmying up a tree. I have pictures. <laughs> yes, Um, you, you mentioned the, uh, the pontoon bridges. Just out of curiosity, did they, did they have those with them? And it's a larger issue of supplies with the maneuver warfare yeah. in, this, in this terrain. I mean, how were, were supplies an issue that they, you know, in order to do this? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Yes, they had pontoon bridges, both of the canvas side and the uh, canvas type and the hard-sided wooden type. The 58th Indiana uh, Infantry was the primary... Uh, bridging unit, and it was attached to the Army of the Cumberland, and Sherman indicated to Schofield in the message traffic that's the, a deeper read than this, obviously, than tonight, that he had bridges enough to span the river four times. And how many did Cox put down? Two. So he had half the Army group's pontoon bridging assets right there that day to cross the, uh, the Chattahoochee River. That's a pretty significant commitment of resources. Yeah. Thank you for your excellent presentation, uh, Brett. Uh, you um, had it one slide on the uh, Shoupades that General Shoup had, had prepared to defend the river line. Yeah. And certainly they're very handsome works of military engineering that were never put to the test if Sherman's infantry had launched frontal attacks against them, uh, they might have proved very formidable. But how resistant do you think they would have been against mass Union artillery bombardment from those heights across the way? They have no bomb proofs, no traverses. It could well be a death line, but a death line for the defenders. Yeah. Sometimes the, the elegance of uh, military engineering as attractive as it appears, 
uh, isn't always uh, as useful, as defensible as one might like. That's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked it. I, I think they were freaked out, to, to use a, a common expression. They were freaked out by what they saw. Was it as formidable as what they thought? Well, the memory of Kennesaw was rattling around in their heads, and they didn't really want to relive anything like that. But what Johnston had done was to take almost all of the uh, Army of Tennessee, save a couple of infantry divisions and the cavalry, and cram them into that line, and it even extend the line a little farther than uh, originally built. So, you know, it, could it have been that he, he um, immobilized his army by doing so, put it in an area where if it had lost, where does it run away to? Well, when you turn around this way, a few hundred yards back here is the Chattahoochee River. You have no place to go. You can't take an army in a moment of, of, of great danger like that and just shove it across the river, even on the bridging assets that they had. So I think it's a really good question. Um, Johnston did not follow Shoup's design. Shoup's design was innovative. I think it freaked the Federals out when they saw it, and they sought something different. But if they had attacked... I don't know, you know, that could have gotten really interesting. If they had broken the Confederate line as Sherman envisioned at Kennesaw uh, and put it in a moment of panic where it might have considered withdrawing in a hurry from the line, it had no place to go. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Did Hood uh, immediately appreciate what Schofield was doing, and did he communicate that up to Johnson, and was there any action taken by Johnson? Yes, there's some interesting uh, um, message traffic that, again, no time to go into here. Um, uh, there was one brigade out of one division from Hardee's Corps combined with a brigade each out of two of Hood's divisions that together would form a kind of fire brigade and they were to go to the south end of Hood's line and protect it should a threat arise there. And that's actually what Cox was supposed to do. But Cox, instead of even doing that, just went down the Sandtown Road after they'd run the, the cavalry away and kept on going until they found a critical intersection that they were pretty sure led to where they wanted to go, and in fact it did. But Hood was mindful of what was going on, but unable to, uh, to take more forceful action for two reasons. One is because the Confederates had attenuated to the point where they could not attenuate further. And secondly, once you move beyond, you got another ground, once you move beyond the south end of the Confederate line, you enter the headwaters of Nickajack Creek, which are kind of like the fingers of my outspread hand. This is very, very rough terrain up here that leads into a main channel. You can't really maneuver on this ground very effectively at all because it's just too rough. I showed you a picture of that uh, right after the innocuous intersection. Uh, that's down in the headwaters of Nickajack Creek, and the terrain there is very convoluted and not easily or quickly traversed. Sure. 